I'm going to my share screen. Are we up? Okay, and to the total slideshow. Are we up? I have a fantastic helper here who helped me last week also, and I sure sure do appreciate it. Peggy Palms has been with us for a couple of years now, and she's just a gem. She's the one who gave us the neat information last week on Minnesota marriages. And today, by the way, a little later in this presentation, uh, Larry has stopped past, and he's going, as a minister uh, in a local church here, he's going to share what Anabaptist religions, some of them do in terms of recording baptisms when they don't do that early on in a child's life. So you'll get a chance to hear from him live right here. So you have your handout, you should, it's about nine pages. And on page five will be the continuum of religious faiths that I'm gonna be talking about. And so it's something you may choose to look at or not. Without further ado, we're gonna try this. Okay, our goals today with birth records uh, differ a little from other things because you always have two possibilities in looking at birth records. You have those birth records and you may be lucky enough occasionally at least to look in the past at least and see these baptismal records, baptismal circuit certificates and so on from your family if uh, they are available. And so if you want to find some of these finding aids uh, that I'm talking about, you need to go to Family Search and Cindy's list. I'm just giving you those as two places. They're both free, and I just don't understand why people don't use them more. Out at Cindy's list, if you want to find uh, baptisms especially, and you want to find articles about them and uh, kind of weird things or different things that have been done with baptism, you want to go out to Cindy's list and just spend a little time there, look at some things with regard to birth and baptism. She keeps her things very, very current. And by this, I mean, turn yourself into an active learner by using uh, anticipatory questions, just like we talked about last week and last month. But we're going to continue as inquiring learners, ready to learn about another type of document, both the formal and the informal evidence that you find. Informal evidence might be Aunt Myrtle telling you that she knows that by doggone, she was there in that church when that baby was baptized. That's a nice example of informal evidence that you can write up. Of course, you'll need to check it, but it is nice. Remember to use the question method that I've taught regarding each piece of info you found on a certificate and do that work. Honest to goodness, take the time to write those questions. For the information on the certificate, and give yourself a pat on the back when you do it, because it's really going to help you in terms of cementing that piece of information in your brain. Remember to summarize it in writing and place it within your family history database. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're working on paper or if you're working from a database, you need to share that info among all the people who were involved in that particular birth record or baptismal certificate. I used to say be aware of these things, but I'm going to talk about being purposefully learning birth hints and informal evidence and alternative forms of proof of birth, because there's a lot of that in the, pre the previous 300 years in our American history and in history across, across the globe. And remember, first of all, record what you have learned via family stories. It seems like even if you find out that it's kind of hinky, there's always an element of truth in there, so it's really important that you do that. I've given you in your materials some, at least one certificate on page two that is a certificate regarding a child named Gregor. That's another one of my dad's brothers, and his name actually was Jack when it came down to it. But this one that I'm showing you is a typical certificate of birth that you might find out online today because so many of the places, Ancestry.com, MyHeritage, Find My Past, 
various places have been able to get hold of these certificates of birth directly from a state if they're 100 years old or even less than that, depending on the state's rules, and they've been able to put them in. So there's lots of room here to uh, look and to put your questions together. You know, we don't question things where they say the name of the child and its color anymore, or maybe we do, but it tells you again that we were even pretty race centric at this time in 1911. And that's a valuable thing for you to know just as a fact in terms of recording births and uh, recording official documents. So this not only records the birth of my dad, who was Byron Robertson, originally named George Eskew. And I wanted you to see that line through his name here because I want you to be aware of the fact that people changed their names about the time that my dad was born. Yes, he was born under the name of Eskew, but his dad changed his last name to Lee just a week later and went back to court and got these changed. And there's evidence here that someone wrote it in on the certificate of birth up there at Haver, Montana. So this is the one that I gave you on Gregor, but it's really Jack. Uh, be aware of the fact that families can change those names. Uh, and here's Gregor, and he's the uh, sixth child in this family, and they were still trying to decide what the name was. And someone wrote in Gregor, but I can tell you that his name uh, later was John David Lee. So you can see what's here. You, you can ask yourself a question about the residence, that it was 10 miles southeast of Haver, Montana. So you can go look up, at, up that homestead and find it for Oscar Eskew or Oscar Lee. But this gives you lots of good information here as to when this certificate was filed and what this birth document looked like. It was interesting to me to find these because my grandma was a staunch Catholic but did not get the opportunity to, to until much later to get all of the kids baptized as Catholics. Oh, here's another one just out of the state of Montana that I've picked at random. You're going to have to remember again that uh, these certificates can be not so well written. You're going to have to do a lot of uh, looking at this document. For instance, the residence for this family is at 309 North and it's Copper Street, believe it or not, in Butte. Uh, and I thought it was two F's at first. So you're gonna to have to work a little bit with these certificates and that's why it's important that you use these questions too. You might see something as simple as this. This is my sister's birth certificate and she would tell you if she were still around that the most important thing was left off of this. It isn't that she was born rural in Lake County, Montana. She was born out of Ferndale and by golly, she was born in the Ferndale store. That was always, a good family story for us. So questions that I'm hoping you will anticipate once you've ordered a birth or baptismal record or as you're thinking about getting one is what kinds of things are, at, are answered within this document and what kinds of things should you anticipate? Usually we anticipate the name of a child or direct evidence that there was an official birth certificate or whatever. And those are all good things. But I'm talking about you learning to anticipate what was the county or place of that birth. And if it sounds not right to you, please remember that states changed counties or added in counties at various times. So you may in fact be looking at the valid county for that original record the date of the birth, the date of the baptism, if you find one, the place of the birth, the full names. Does it include mom's maiden name? What were their occupations? What were the residents of the parents with regard to that baptism? And where did they, where did they, what church did they go to? You know, I lived out in rural Lake County and that was 35 miles from a Catholic church in Polson, Montana. It was still 19 miles from St. Anne's Catholic Church over in Summers, Montana. Uh, I was baptized right at the hospital 
in Kalispell, Montana. I found that interesting. Apparently, they thought my low birth rate, uh, birth weight, meant something because I was I was under five pounds. The names and the birthplaces of parents. The names of the witnesses were they relatives or friends? Mine were two nurses in the hospital. The name of the church or the minister or the priest? Yes, there there was a Catholic church uh, priest involved. Any extra info that was collected by the minister, you're going to find some things. You're going to find people who wrote lots of notes, not only on the birth or the baptismal record, because these also include county employees, but they also include uh, ministers who said who were really, really good. And... Uh, I'm reminded Diane Klinsky said, well, of course you were. The, the Kalispell Hospital was a Catholic one, Jan, and I have to remember that. What got omitted, even though it was asked, were, are there lines that weren't filled in? You need to ask yourself, why? So write that summary, including all the information found. I know that I sound like I'm, you know, I'm really ragging on this through these, but seriously, no Snoopy dance until your summary is complete. After all, I'm just going to make my, my claim for you here. What's the sense of getting any official record if you don't make full use of all the information you've found? You need to be a better reader and a recorder. And you still need later on, go back and say, have I learned enough now maybe about baptisms that I need to go back and look at some of those baptismal certificates that I have that people saved? I would anticipate today that I hope you do. Do it now, use the information found, put it into each person's file. That means even into the witnesses files. That's very important for you. With practice, I get this done still in about 40 minutes. There's not been one certificate that takes less for me, maybe because I'm re really trying to absorb the information so that I've got it at my, um, hopefully my dendrites, whatever, in my brain so that I know a little bit more about these people each time and put it into your family timeline. It's a very important thing to do. I'll talk briefly about some alternative proofs of birth, excluding baptism. The best one that I can tell you generally, especially in the Western states, although it's available depending on the county in Southern states and in Eastern states, but the best thing that I've found that gets used legally by lawyers and other people uh, and courts is the school census, which was done every single year in the fall. Uh, in fact, it was done in Montana locally until 2006 when the state took over that record keeping. But I can tell you, we have all the records for Cascade County beginning 1896 going forward for the school censuses. And it's a really great way to be able to find out about families. It will give you the name of the child the age, the date of birth, the parents or the guardians at that point, and their address. It will not give you the school they attended. It will give you, you information on those students, however, from the age of zero through 21. I do have a program out on YouTube about those school censuses, I believe. Go take a look at that one. Another thing that we'll see in a minute, and I've given you a copy in your handout, is a delayed birth certificate. I'm showing you my dad's. Uh, yes, he had a real birth certificate, which had his name scratched out. So he made sure he got that delayed birth certificate. So there could be no doubt about uh, who he was when he went out to Washington State to get jobs out there. You can also look at social security applications and many of those are available today as our railroad records out on uh, the NARA site, the National Archives site. You'll also find them uh, frequently at Ancestry. One that I love for the required child support in England in past centuries is this thing called a bastardy bond. And Maybe they called it by a more genteel name in some of the counties, but in fact, it was the paper trail of required child support in England. 
they didn't get let you get away with very much from about it 1780 on. You can look at baptismal records, and of course, you can look at church annals. That is the actual notes, not the certificates, but the day-to-day -day, uh, notes that a priest or a minister has made regarding that week in the church. Today, we might also use various kinds of uh, newspapers or whatever that churches have. So here's my my dad's uh, alternative or delayed birth registration. This is very common across all the United States. It's also common in some places in Canada. Uh, I cannot speak for uh, some of the provinces, but I have found these in Canada. A certificate of delayed registration. Let's see what my dad used to prove who he was. He had his folks in there uh, with their correct places of birth, at least according to what he knew. He has on letterhead the Hill County Superintendent of Schools Affidavit of School Census Records for the year 1923. Yep, that's a very, very value, valued thing used here and used in other legal work. He has a baptismal record and note that it says that he was born on May 2, 1911, wasn't baptized till 1923. Uh, and then, of course, he presents it and they give him that delayed certificate, which he used and which you're going to find with many people. You should seek a delayed birth registration for those people who were born prior to 1936, because later on, if they wanted uh, to take part in Social Security or in those railroad retirements, they had to have something like this if they did not have proof of their birth registration in a more common way. And I'll tell you, there were lots of counties who have maybe who maybe took the certificates in, but didn't do too much about making them available to people. In fact, sometimes people were told it just wasn't available. So check that certificate of delayed birth registration. Here's uh, my dad's draft registration card for Montana in World War II. It's another way to at least get a birth age or some kind of a certificate. It depends on the state, but you can find that notice here. They have the date of birth and his age in years and his place of birth. And so because it is an official record, it's something else that you can use as a substitute. It should be among other documents, preferably. I'm going to go back and tell you about Cindy's list again, because there's just all kinds of things out there. How to find the father of an illegitimate child. And she doesn't just tell you how to find it in the United States. This one happens to be for Dutch genealogy, because they had many things going on just as we have. And using DNA testing, which, by the way, is legal in... Uh, new in uh, Amsterdam and the Netherlands and whatever today, but is not legal in some of the other countries to use in Europe. So be aware of the rules and look at the things from the European Union. I'm going to ask next that you suspend what you think you know about baptism as you look at forms of baptism in early America. We're really fortunate that we have Pennsylvania available to look at because we've all known that it was a place for religious freedom. Uh, we've known what happened early on, but the best evidence sometimes of how religions changed or what they did for forms of birth, death, marriage, and so on are right there when you begin to look at some documents there, occasionally in Maryland and in some other places. I would ask you in that, that set of questions we have to say, could my current knowledge of baptismal beliefs get in the way as I search to find birth and baptism records from the past? Knowing only my mom and dad's generation and my grandparents, I would have looked in Catholic records and I needed to look way further when I looked back at my family in Pennsylvania. My goal is to find those baptism records and those birth records. So I need to look at this pretty dispassionately instead of saying, well, I only need to look one place. 
Those family stories can help and they can give you hints, but be broad-minded. You need to understand or begin to question what kinds of birth records existed in our past America. Could they have existed in Europe? And what questions should I ask? What information do I need as I begin to look for all of those early records? And how can it help if I know what the local churches were in the county where they were living? So our goals are to learn about baptism differences among religions, just enough that you just have that little tingle or that little sense that says, I better check that. They lived in a county that was pretty rural and there weren't too many people, kind of like the 16 counties in Montana that we have that today are still called uh, pretty much rural. They, we have 16 of them that are counted uh, and described, I should say, differently whenever we take a US census every 10 years. Uh, they're still recorded as what, what is known as frontier counties. So you have to think that way when you look at, at other places. I want you to be a continuing inquiring learner based on what you learn. You're gonna learn a little bit today, maybe just enough to be confused. I hope not, but I hope you learn enough today that you begin to question some of the documents that you've seen before. Or it might work to say, yeah, you know, that really affirmed what really did happen way back then. We're gonna talk mainly about Pennsylvania from uh, the point of view of an author that, I've, uh, that I really revere because of the huge study that he did over about 35 years on Pennsylvania records. Here he is. His name was John Thomas Humphrey. His book on understanding and using baptismal records was produced in 1998. He only did that after he looked at a variety of things in Pennsylvania. He went into like 14 different counties and looked at every church record available across all of the religions for the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and made records of what was actually there and what could have happened with certain records. He calls this within Christianity only, the continuum of religious faiths. And his book, by the way, I saw last week was available for four or $5 out online. So it's, if you choose to get it and choose to look at it, it is really valuable for you. And uh, it's pretty nice for a library if your current library doesn't have it either. So the continuum of, of religious faith, he starts way back with the base position being the Catholic religion way, way back, having some pretty stringent uh, types of things that were done. When I read the book the first time, I was dumbfounded to find that it was very, very common in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries and so on to make sure that the newly born child had salt on its tongue. That's just one thing that I'll intrigue you with. There were many other things uh, in terms of who could be a witness and who could not. Uh, and that, that did not change for the Catholic religion, but when it got to England and when it got to, especially to what became the United States in colonial times, that is before United States became an official country, then we have some differences. So we have first removed churches, the Moravian, which was the first one that removed itself from the Catholic Church, the Lutherans, and then three that are kind of together, Church of England, Protestant Episcopal, and a little later, the Methodists, some reformed churches that uh, did some very different things from the Catholics in terms of baptism, Swiss German reformed, Presbyterians and Dutch reformed. Anabaptist and Baptist religions, including Mennonite and Amish Mennonite Baptists, and one I found in my family, the Dunkards, uh, way before they were ever Catholic, uh, and the Quakers. So I will refer to these again today. These are on page five of your handout, if you are looking into that handout at this point. Just to give you an idea of things that uh, John Humphrey did, he went out and looked at every repository possible, spent 
billions, well, maybe not billions, but lots of hours looking at these records. And then he produced a set of books that will tell you, you know, common things about a particular baptism for your family in four, one of 14 different counties in Pennsylvania. And then he will tell you what kind of religion that baptism was based on. These are pretty neat. We have most all of his books in our library here. In the Catholic Church, baptism was, and it still is open to everyone. Parental membership is not a prerequisite. Consent of parents is not required if a child is in danger of death. So I'm back there thinking again at that Catholic hospital in Kalispell. I make you bet we all got baptized. Remember, in the Catholic Church and a few other churches, Baptism was supposed to be only one time, just as confirmation later in a church was supposed to be only one time. In the Catholic Church, only one parent's consent would be needed otherwise, but you could do uh, an emergency baptism, and they did. And one of the things you should know is that it was common in the backcountry, not just in Pennsylvania. I also found it uh, on at least one occasion in the North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, back country where a child was baptized by a uh, Catholic priest and the family was definitely Protestant. So look for evidence in some of those registers. Humphrey will point you right back to the original registers. But the thing in a Catholic church, here are the things you're looking for. In the permanent record for baptism, the name of the baptized, the minister, the parents, the sponsors, the place and day of the baptism, and not necessarily the birth certificate, but a lot of priests did that anyway. Look for the parentheses. Illegitimate births within the Catholic Church were recorded with information about mom and dad if they requested their names be listed. Otherwise, you need to know if they said, no, don't list us. They were listed as unknown, even if uh, they were there. So look beyond what you think you know and be curious and be thorough. Just because that child was recorded as illegitimate does not mean that one of those people was not there. Confirmation was, of course, the finish of baptism. It was completion. Uh, and it was for children ages 7 to 12 way back when. But I need to tell you right now, don't look for confirmation in the records in Pennsylvania in colonial times because we didn't have a Catholic diocese officially created till 1789 and anything else, the records would be in England if they in fact ever happened because you had to have a bishop involved in that ceremony. So the religion first removed from the Catholic rite of baptism were because they were the ones who went out first. Remember, I've told you that that's the Moravians then the Lutherans, and within a certain time span, the Church of England, of course, uh, the Anglican Church, the Protestant Episcopal Church, and Methodists a little later. Lutheran Church baptisms, Luther still regarded baptism as salvation. He simplified the ceremony. I can tell you there was no salt in the infant's mouth, and the sponsors could finally be relatives. Uh, and the sponsors' names appear in the German and Pennsylvanian registers, and they are likely to be relatives because of the backcountry nature of many of those churches. Could be different in Philadelphia, but otherwise look to see if they're relatives. Again, baptism was still open to everybody. There were no obstructions. In fact, formally, they formally rejected the idea of refusal to baptize in 1780. It was their duty to do that for Protestants if those children were brought into their church. It's the first removed example. They were Swedes on the Delaware River in 1738 who established five Lutheran churches within six years or so. Two of them were over in Pennsylvania and they also helped over there do the German Lutheran churches, which frequently were what we called reformed Lutheran churches. It was pretty open. Those records in Philadelphia don't begin till 1750, uh, but the entries probably are gonna have the location of the family plus the sponsors. So look for, again, those relatives. Looks pretty much like a Catholic record 
The exceptions abound. Sometimes they were pretty brief. Just the name, the baptismal date, the father, not always the mom. Sometimes ministers did tell more, like maybe this family had recently immigrated from a place uh, and the place of origin. Maybe they'd just come off a ship and they wanted to make sure that a child that had been on a ship was baptized. And they were to notify the minister prior to the expected baptism. That did not always happen. The Protestant Episcopal Church or Anglican first removed, they used and specified the baptismal ceremony in their Book of Common Prayer. Uh, they sprinkled only with holy water. They did not immerse a child. Uh, they had emergency baptism rules and they were pretty loose with those. It was regarded as a salvation from sin. So sin, so infants were baptized as soon as possible and it could be a private baptism. That also occurred, by the way, in the Catholic Church. Uh, they had a conditional baptism, assuming that a previous baptism had not occurred. And they began providing for some adult baptisms later in that 17th century, 1661. Until 1865, they continued the Catholic pra practice in which parents should especially not be godparents, but they were a lot more relaxed with regard to relatives. But again, they could not refuse baptism to anyone. And godparents in that church had the duty of ensuring the right of confirmation later for that child. So they were more serious. Anglican rules began in 1603 with parliamentary law back in England. They said you had to do the name of the infant, the names of the parents, the dates of birth and baptism. Sponsors were not named because they weren't specified in the law. And if you read Humphrey's book, most all of these Anglican registrations in church records have been re have are, they just don't exist in those Pennsylvania counties uh, to my chagrin because my husband's family had those and I looked for them for a long time till I saw this. The Anglican ministers promised obedience to the king. So uh, most of the people in Pennsylvania left and took their records with them if they had them at the end of the revolution in Pennsylvania. And it finally got approved as a Protestant Episcopal church. The ones, by the way, that were over in Maryland, New York, and Virginia, the Anglican church in those co colonies had been designated as a state church. So those ministers were previously paid by the colony. That pay stopped, of course, but you might have better luck finding those records, especially in Maryland. The Moravian Church of Pennsylvania was founded in 1457 as the oldest known pro Protestant denomination. There were 200 thousand members by the 16th century. But after that, that number was reduced by wars. Yes, they were flat out killed. The Moravian Church in Pennsylvania combined several doctrines. They said baptism was salvation, but those who died unbaptized, they were still saved because they were innocents. The baptism was by sprinkling right after birth and you might find as many five as five witnesses or sponsors. A little side note, they were, Moravians were big on working with indigenous uh, in Pennsylvania, and they added a form of exorcism when they baptized those indigenous babies, uh, saying all powers of darkness were commanded to depart from the baptized. If you see that, that's another valuable clue for you. Today, they're called the United Brethren, generally. They discouraged private baptism. They wanted it during a public worship service because they wanted the congregation to participate. They do show that they baptized infants of non-Moravians, but some were baptisms were refused if the minister did not know the parents. Figuring, hey, maybe our Moravian church could later be held responsible for the upbringing of that child. What you'll find that's valuable here when you see the actual Moravian record is that each baptismal entry is numbered. It has a name, date, names of both parents, date of birth, baptism, name of each sponsor, name of each minister performing the baptism, and sometimes even the place. Be aware 
that that minister moved around. So place was conditional. Uh, early on, the sponsors named in within the Moravian church had to be from the gender of the child. But you sometimes will see the maiden name of the mom and also the female sponsors. A little later in time, the Methodist church began as an offshoot of the Church of England uh, due to John and Charles Wesley and their friend George Whitefield, who were all Anglican ministers initially. And that Methodist merely means one who lives according to the method laid down in the Bible. They set themselves apart from the Church of England uh, on December 25, 1784 at Baltimore. So it was a, about uh, at the end of uh, an attenuated revolution so far as religions were concerned. The baptism was a sign of regenerated birth and they were to be organized. Those children were to be organized into classes as uh, the means to learn more about the truth of scripture. You'll see in my notes, it tells you that after the revolution, the Methodist church had the name of the child, name of parents, date of birth and death of baptism. And the first registry in Philadelphia is 1785, just that year after they had separated themselves from the Anglican church. Here's another hint for you. You might be looking at a different church register for those children who were born before 1784. The Reformed tradition in churches, the German Reformed Church, uh, the Germans and the Swiss had what is known as the Heidelberg Catechism as a founding document. I will tell you, frankly, I don't know too much about that document, uh, but I'm sure that we can find it in historic records. It also includes the Swiss and Dutch Reformed Churches and the Presbyterian Church, where one of the biggies is within this Baptism is regarded as an actual entry into a church. So it changes what they felt about those uh, young children uh, being baptized from out of the other spectrum of religion. It was regarded as entry, so it did not guarantee salvation. They had the right to access their sacraments. They called them sealing ordinances. The baptism was performed in the presence of a congregation brought to baptism by a parent's faith. So they needed, the parents needed to have a certificate of membership in good standing in that Methodist church. And they, of course, had to ask in advance. And confirmation changed too. It became a profession of, of faith when they reached the age of accountability, which is quite different from that original Catholic idea of confirming ages seven through 12. There are very few registers, I'm gonna tell you that, but John Humphrey says that we should use the session records, that is the various uh, annals and church records that are found that are kept by Methodist ministers, by, by Presbyterian ministers, pardon me. You'll find indirect evidence where parents ask to have a child baptized, and sometimes even that child is named, but not always. If there are early records, there will be the name of the infant, the name of the dad, and the date of baptism. In the German Reformed Church, uh, founded in Pennsylvania, all infants who die unbaptized were still saved because they said they were too young to be sinners. It was limited to children of parents who belonged to the church. One pay, parent had to have been confirmed in that reformed church and witnesses were required, but parents were responsible for a child's faith. And parents who had illegitimacy in taken into account had to privately admit to the sin. And just in the register, the child would be, would be recorded as Ill illegitimate. Generally, that record has a name of the child, parents' names, dates of birth, baptism, and witnesses, however. And there are lots of these available in Pennsylvania. The Dutch Reformed, uh, they devised their own records again, views on baptism very similar to Presbyterian records, but they're gonna be consistent. The name of the child, the name of the parents, the name of the minister, the name of the ministers, 
uh, a name of the witnesses and women kept their paid maiden names. So you're going to find these in that Dutch Reformed Church because they were using patronymic naming traditions. Uh, so you're going to have to investigate if you're a genealogist, both that maiden and later that marriage name that sometimes appears in parentheses. Last or nearly last, the Anabaptist and the Baptist church traditions, including the Mennonites, the Amish, the Baptists, Hutterites, Dunkards, Seventh-day Adventists, the primary belief for them was quite removed from that first Catholic uh, baptism in which the children were baptized immediately or as soon as possible. They had a belief in believer baptism, that is, baptism freely entered into as an adult. Thus, the emphasis is not on the record of baptism. And so it took place, baptism took many forms. Mennonites baptized by pouring water, baptized, Baptists baptized by immersion backward. Dunkards, one that I had in my family, was baptized by immersion in a stream going three times forward in the immersion. Just differences, you need to read about the faith so you find those. Many of these groups were persecuted so they kept no records and that became a tradition. Remember in England in the 1648 law, if you did not believe in infant baptism and you said so, you could be imprisoned for life. In Switzerland, even worse occurred. Anabaptists were fined, they were jailed, they were drowned, burned at the stake. Adults were come to, condemned to death without any trial, just because they believed that they should not be baptized as, as a child. And they could be baptized again as an adult if they had been baptized as a child. So these people, I've given you a little background about them in your notes about the Amish Mennonites, uh, the believer baptism. They were the largest Anabaptist group in early Pennsylvania, the Mennonites were. If they came through Netherlands, you might find early records in Netherlands, and many of them actually did that. Uh, others in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, they did not keep records. Um, and Am Amish Mennonites, in fact, beginning 1793, performed the fact, the practice of shunning any of those in their religion who broke their rules. I'm hoping that I can have Larry come up here really quickly and show you some records from his church and talk just for a minute about the records. We won't be able to actually show the records, but he can talk about them from this. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go backward on that for that space. But uh, here's Larry to tell you about that continuum of beliefs and what happens in the Church of the Nazarene. Well, I want to say just a little bit about the men in the, or the Anabaptists in Switzerland, too. Part of the deal was with the Swiss Reformed Church. When the child was baptized, it was a uh, state church. So by being baptized, you became a citizen of Switzerland, which also made you then eligible for the military, which was another thing that the Anabaptists stood against. So that there was just a real whole lot of things in the conflict there. But uh, I mentioned to Jan earlier today that I could bring our um, church record book from the Church of the Nazarene, of which I've been an associate pastor. Um, and it's another one that practices believer baptism, but we do provide records for children and it records the parents' names, uh, including the wife's or the mother's maiden name and the birth date are there. The unfortunate thing with a lot of evangelical churches is that there's not, there's no strict rule for keeping the records. I have worked with pastors who hated doing paperwork. And so it became my job. And if they didn't have an associate, a lot of them just did not keep these records other than membership records. And then others, I worked with one pastor, uh, slightly different on, on marriage records are supposed to be kept. He kept a personal record, which was never turned into the church. So we have a gap for 12 years. And so unfortunately, with evangelical churches, records can be really difficult to find because there was no specific 
form to use, no specific book. But I have done my best, at least here locally, for the years that I've been an associate. And we do get phone calls every once in a while for somebody checking to see if they were uh, baptized at our church or dedicated as an infant was another term that they would use. So just good luck at finding records with evangelical churches. <laughs> Thank you, Larry, very much. Uh, and Larry's still going to be here to participate in questions later. So uh, as we move on from this, from the evangelical churches and the things that he's been, the valuable things, in fact, that he's been able to share. Thank you, Larry. Mm -hmm. Let's look quickly at the Baptists as separatists because they said the church and the state should be separate. So the record's going to be really scant. Uh, and sometimes they even got into the Quaker calendar tradition. We're not talking about that here because that requires a whole session. So there's no early conformity in the records. Um, and so, uh, as Larry says, good luck in finding some of those. They baptized only the believers. They didn't do infants. They used a backward immersion ceremony as it resembled dying and rising again. Uh, and so that's something that you could look for within the church annals or the notes from the minister if there were records. The Dunkards. They established, they were established in 178 to live in all things according to the New Testament. Uh, there was no infant baptism, no basis in the scripture, they said, and infants were innocent anyway, and adult baptism would not be automatic. They practiced a trine immersion. Adults gave a public confession of faith, and they were immersed forward three times in a flowing stream. So I take it that that did not happen in the middle of winter. <laughs> I hope. And no early baptismal records were kept. Darn. Quakers and the Society of Friends. Divine goodness and virtue passes from Jesus Christ into every human soul. Christ died for everyone, they believe. And so they have lay persons as their missionaries. They rejected ordination of a priest or a minister. Organized around a system of meetings. And there are good good records for Quakers. We have many of them here in uh, our particular library. Uh, and they said that every meeting would should keep records of births and burials of the dead that die in the Lord. And marriages were added in soon after. Those records can be pretty interesting to look at Quakers because sometimes they removed people and uh, when that happened, then uh, sometimes the records at least were scratched out with one line through them with no explanation. They were noted, though, in the monthly meeting record, and they were essentially family registers. Oh, my gosh. They were family style. All the husband, the wife, and the kids are all listed together, not by date, order of birth. So you have to look at all the records on the family in a register. Or if they move to another monthly meeting, you would have to look at the records there. New immigrants were urged to write their family records into the monthly meeting when they came, bringing certificates from a previous Quaker meeting place. Sometimes you'll see then that they're recorded in at least two or three other places. Uh, that parents were in the first place to record the child's birth in the presence of the midwife or the doctor, and all the adults present at the time of the birth were to sign the certificate or the piece of paper, and then it would be recorded in a monthly meeting book. That was the thought anyway. I want you to look for entering and leaving meetings, and also those records of disownment due to yielding to temptation, because <laughs> You're going to have to look in previous meeting records in order to find out more about those. Or luckily, some of those redundant records that you can find in Quaker records may reveal more or other information for you or discrepancies where things were recorded one way one time and recorded the next way. Um, look to see in that instance, if you see that they were recorded another way, look to see what the handwriting is. Is it the standard format handwriting that you see in that set of meeting notes or could the parent have written that directly in? Just a hint for you. 
there we go. Thinking about your ancestors, surroundings, and neighbors is very important when you're looking at births and the local context at the time and who might have been able to baptize that baby. You need to learn about that local context and the times, including available religions. That means that if your person were a homesteader in Montana and you're in Shoto County, for example, which was one of the six large counties early on, you need to be looking at what was actually available because there were uh, Methodist ministers, but they were on a circuit. Yes, there would be Catholic churches, but sometimes the priest was elsewhere because he had several churches to take care of. Be willing to seek wide. I found Lutheran Reformed in my family who had been baptized in a Catholic church in Pennsylvania pre-1760. And there they were, and they were solidly Lutheran. I found other brothers from that same family who became Dunkards, believe it or not. And 70 years later, their families were Methodists. So it helps to keep your mind open. Look at every available record for the county, not just at what you have an expectation to find. Uh, I found those records widely varied in Northampton and Luzerne counties in Pennsylvania, and just as varied when I looked at Philadelphia. Well, next time, we're going to pursue that thing that somebody wants us to do uh, called those divorces and who got them. So I'm going to turn back now uh, from screen sharing. I'm going to stop the share so that we can talk about any questions you might have. <laughs> 